NBC News Live. Drive-by shootings at the homes of at least four officials are allegedly linked to a failed candidate. How police say he planned the attacks. On the brink of collapse, the infrastructure of the Ukrainian capital of Kyiv is now on the verge of failing after repeated missile attacks as the death toll is rising from a major barrage. White House National Security Spokesperson John Kirby joins us to talk about supporting Ukraine and how far the U.S. can go. A Massachusetts man is now charged with murder after the disappearance of his wife. He was already in jail for allegedly misleading investigators who said that they found a bloody knife in the family's basement, the latest on the search for his wife's body. Plus, a horrifying video just released to the public as a man stands trial for a deadly ISIS-inspired attack in 2017. We're seeing the moments after police say they used a truck to run down the victims. And it's a familiar sight, black smoke pouring from the back of a school bus. But more districts are doing away with diesel in favor of electric. And it's not just about the environment, but also protecting future generations. Our students would come and testify at board meetings and really um, push us to reflect on how we were improving our carbon footprint. everyone I'm Lindsay Davis thank you so much for streaming with us overseas tonight in Ukraine Russian forces are relentlessly targeting Ukraine's infrastructure in the dead of winter as some Western leaders are debating sending tanks to Ukraine in an effort to help Matt Gutman and our team were inside a power plant damaged by the shelling and we'll have more in a moment we also have White House National Security spokesperson John Kirby standing by but we begin here at home where a former Republican candidate for the New Mexico State House is under arrest in connection with brazen political violence against four Democratic officials. Solomon Pena was arrested at his home in Albuquerque yesterday in a SWAT team operation. Authorities say that he was the mastermind behind a conspiracy where four men were paid to shoot up the homes of Democratic officials. One incident hit the bedroom of a state senator's daughter who was just 10 years old. Pena's arrest comes amid a growing number of threats to elected officials from both parties. Mola Lenghi leads us off tonight from Albuquerque. Tonight, authorities say the man approaching this front door is a Republican who lost his election in New Mexico in a landslide, showing up at the homes of state and county Democratic leaders after the election, angry and falsely claiming the election was somehow rigged. Hi, my name's Solomon Pena. Police say 39-year-old Solomon Pena arrived at this home looking for one of his alleged targets. Police say over the course of four weeks, four homes were sprayed with bullets. In one home, blasting right through a state lawmaker's 10-year-old daughter's bedroom. All of these homes where Democrats lived. Police say Pena hired hitmen to take aim at the homes and that Pena fired at one of them himself. Tonight, Pena is under arrest. Police and SWAT teams moving in 24 hours ago in Albuquerque. Officials saying the failed Republican politician was an election denier who police say hired those four hitmen paying them with cash and providing them with weapons. These shootings were orchestrated. They were dangerous attacks, not only to these individuals, but fundamentally also to democracy. The targets, two state legislators and two county commissioners. Officials say the plot was fueled by Pena's anger over his loss for that state house seat. He'd reportedly been in state prison for seven years for burglary, a judge allowing him to run for office. He had complaints about his election. He felt it was rigged. He's an election denier. He doesn't want to accept the results of the election. The first shooting was on December 4th, when authorities say County Commissioner Adrian Barboa's home was struck repeatedly by gunfire, like, telling us today... My home was shot up for shots directly through my front door, right through my living room where I had just few hours before I've been playing with my grandbaby. Authorities say fortunately no one was injured in any of the shootings. The arrest warrant revealing that just hours after the final shooting on January 3rd, police cracked the case wide open when one of Pena's alleged hitmen was pulled over for an expired registration. Police say they found cash, guns and drugs in that car and it was registered to Pena. At the end of the day, this was about a right-wing radical an election denier who did the worst imaginable thing you can do when you have a political disagreement, which has turned that to violence. Really such drastic measures taken here. Mola Lange joins us now from Albuquerque. Mola, the suspect, Solomon Pena, expressed support for Donald Trump on social media and complained of a rigged election. And really, this is the kind of rhetoric that officials are worried is, is leading to more violence. 
Well, they are, Lindsay, and you remember that this shooting, these shootings happening just weeks after the attack on former Speaker Nancy Pelosi's husband in their San Francisco home. And the FBI recently warning that the threats, violent threats in particular, against public officials is on the rise nationwide. Now, we should stress that the county commissioner here telling me today that there were no election irregularities here that Mr. Pena lost his election fair and square, Lindsay. Really significant to note that. All right, Mola Lange, our thanks to you. The husband of a Massachusetts mother of three who's been missing since New Year's Day has been charged with murder. The news comes while he was already in police custody for allegedly misleading investigators. ABC's Stephanie Ramos has those details. Tonight, the husband of that Massachusetts mother of three who vanished more than two weeks ago on New Year's Day, now charged with her murder. The continued investigation has now allowed police to obtain an arrest warrant charging Brian Walsh with the murder of his wife. Brian Walsh already in police custody for allegedly misleading investigators after Anna Walsh went missing. He's pleaded not guilty. Anna, last seen by a relative in the early hours of January 1st, leaving her Boston area home for a flight to Washington, D.C. that investigators say she never boarded. Authorities launching an exhaustive search after she was reported missing by both her husband and her employer. Police finding a bloody knife in the basement of the family's Cohasset home. Authorities also allege Walsh said the day after his wife disappeared, he left the house to only get a treat for their son, but surveillance footage capturing him at this Home Depot. Sometime after 4 o'clock, went to the Home Depot. He's on surveillance at that time, purchasing about $450 worth of cleaning supplies. That would include mops, bucket, tops, um, TVEX, uh, drop cloths, uh, as well as various kinds of tape. Stephanie Ramos joins us now. Stephanie, what's next for the suspect? So Walsh is expected to be arraigned tomorrow where prosecutors are expected to lay out evidence that led to this murder charge. Police say Anna Walsh's body hasn't been found. Lindsay. All right, Stephanie Ramos, our thanks to you. Now to Washington, where President Biden remains under fire after his lawyers revealed this weekend that five more pages of classified documents were found at his Delaware home. The president ignored questions on the matter when pressed during an Oval Office meeting today as House Republicans say they'll investigate. ABC's chief White House correspondent Cecilia Vega has the latest. Sir, why are you telling us President Biden today in the Oval Office all smiles as he ignored questions about the growing number of classified documents found in his Delaware home. Over the weekend, the White House revealing they discovered five more pages of classified material last Thursday. The administration now under fire for not disclosing that information sooner. On Friday, you stood here, though, and were asked about this documents issued by our counsel 18 times. At that point, the president's lawyers had found these five additional pages of classified documents. So did you not know on Friday that those documents had been found when you were at the podium? I have been forthcoming from this podium. What I uh, said yes to was what the statement at the time that we all had. Right, you all had the statement, uh, and I was repeating what the what the uh, council was sharing at that time. The press secretary finally acknowledging she didn't know the new documents had been found. I provided the information that you all had at the time, and I confirmed. No, I did not know. House Republicans who have launched their own investigations today attacking President Biden for taking months to admit he kept classified documents from the Obama administration. This is why there's such hypocrisy behind the Bidens once again, something big that comes forward prior to an election where they kind of keep it quiet, where the American public could actually have a say. In. Now the White House accusing Republicans of their own brand of hypocrisy, noting they showed little interest in investigating Donald Trump, who took hundreds of classified documents to his Mar-a-Lago home and repeatedly refused to hand them over to the FBI. In contrast, the Biden team has been cooperating with the Justice Department from the start. Cecilia Vega joins us now from the White House. Cecilia, there's new reporting tonight on the Justice Department's decision on whether to have FBI agents monitor the search for documents at Biden's Delaware home. Uh, what's the latest there? Yeah, Lindsay, this is a question that has been persistent from Republicans from the start that this story has break, broken and it is just coming in right now. So we are learning that the FBI considered but ultimately decided against monitoring uh, the lawyers who were searching for these documents. Sources say in part because the Biden team has been cooperating. Look, Lindsay, the White House is not commenting on this one right now, but I can tell you I was here all day. You heard us there in the briefing room with the press secretary. They are in full damage control here and these questions just keep on coming.
They certainly do. All right, Cecilia Vega from the White House, thanks so much. We head overseas now to the war in Ukraine where the ruthless bloodshed continues, this time an apartment building demolished by a missile made to sink aircraft carriers as a mission to protect power plants continues. Matt Gutman is in Dnipro for us tonight. After a Russian missile obliterated this residential building in Dnipro, the death toll tonight rising to at least 45, six of them children. The same salvo of Russian missiles that destroyed the apartment block also targeting critical infrastructure across Ukraine. And in central Ukraine today, we had rare access to one of the country's battered power plants, hit 12 times since July. Wreckage everywhere. He's saying that every time a transformer like this is hit, it takes out power for thousands of families at a time. So precious is electricity that this coal-powered plant is now considered a top-secret site. One of the managers taking us through Russian missile parts littering the site. And I just want you to see the power of the shrapnel in that missile pinging holes in pure steel. From the destroyed transformers down the gangplank to the main plant, inside, it's enormous. The scale and the size of this machinery almost defies comprehension, but it's something on this scale that is required to provide power to a city. In the control room, the windows packed with sandbags and body armor. He says there were once engineers, but now... The soldiers' energy front. There are soldiers on the energy front. Blah, blah. Matt Gutman joins us now from Dnipro. Matt, any idea how long the recovery will take for this power plant uh, to become fully functional again? Uh, Lindsay, the manager told us that they work on it pretty much every single day. And they've only been able to fix about 20% of what Russian missiles have destroyed so far. What they need, they say, are parts. And not just small parts, but we're talking about, you know, train size tra uh, transformers. Really massive pieces of equipment that have to come from Europe. And there is the constant everyday threat of additional bombardment. And while we were there, we got a notice from... The other guy who was there, uh, the, the, the chief manager, that a Russian missile had been launched in the direction of the power plant that we probably have to leave very shortly. Apparently, they said Russian air uh, Ukrainian air defenses neutralized it, but that's the kind of thing they live with every day. And one of the things we didn't show you in the piece is the bunker they took us to where we had to sit for about an hour. They sometimes live down there for as long as a week until they can finish all of the repairs on the power plant and report up the chain that they've got things under control again are able to supply power so this is a constant game of whack-a-mole for them and there is a distinct possibility that uh, these cities could go dark for a significant period of time Lindsay wow so these rolling outages continue Matt Gutman for us in Dnipro thanks so much Matt for more now let's bring in White House National Security Council spokesperson John Kirby thank you so much for your time tonight Mr. Kirby as we see reports that Kyiv's infrastructure is under critical strain we just saw our Matt Gutman there inside a crippled power plant near Dnipro Ukraine has repeatedly pleaded with the West for tanks President Biden today spoke with Germany's Chancellor Germany is of course considering sending tanks to Ukraine are tanks at this point simply a red line for the US well, it's not about red lines for the U.S. or for any other country. These are sovereign decisions that nations are making to support Ukraine. We've been the leading uh, contributor of security assistance for Ukraine around the world to the tune of something like $25 billion in security assistance alone. And we have evolved that security assistance with the kinds of needs that they have on the battlefield. Now, President Zelensky's made it clear that he's interested in, in tanks. And there are some nations that, uh, that, in case of Great Britain, have announced some uh, and others that are considering that. Uh, we respect that and we're grateful for that support. Uh, what we want to make sure is that what we're giving Ukraine is useful for them in the fight that they are in right now, not just in terms of quantity, but in terms of the kind of quality of the systems that they're getting. Uh, roughly 100 Ukrainian troops arrived on U.S. soil yesterday. It, what's the timeline for getting them trained? Those tra training has just started, you're right, uh, and uh, we've got, in, in the case of the Patriot missile batteries, that, uh, that training has started this weekend uh, here in the United States. That'll take about uh, 10 weeks, uh, and then there'll be several weeks of this combined arms training that, uh, that we're doing with uh, Ukrainian battalion-sized units. Uh, it'll take several weeks uh, to get them through this combined arms maneuver training, and the idea there is it's not just one and done. We're going to keep battalions coming through that training over the next uh, coming weeks and months. If Western countries are sending Patriot missiles, aircraft, potentially tanks, Ukrainian soldiers are arriving on U.S. soil to train, at what point would you say that the U.S. and its allies are, are just directly in this war with Russia as opposed to simply providing support? 
We are supporting Ukraine's ability to defend itself and to defend oneself uh, against the threat that they're posed, uh, that Russia poses, continues to pose to them. Uh, you got to have capabilities, uh, air defense, artillery, armor, ammunition. Um, you also have to have the knowledge to use those capabilities. Now, in some cases, like small arms ammunition, the Ukrainians don't need any help. They know how to fire small arms. But when you're giving more advanced systems like the Patriot system, uh, like the Bradley fighting vehicles, uh, such as the tanks, I'm sure that, uh, that the British now have uh, said that they're going to provide that's going to require some training. You're going to have to be able to take some troops uh, off the line. But make no mistake, this is a war Russia has prosecuted against Ukraine. It's Russia's ag uh, against Ukraine. It's not, no matter what Putin might say, uh, it's not the West versus Russia. It's not NATO versus Russia. It's certainly not the United States versus Russia. Uh, general Mark Milley met in person today with a top Ukrainian general at the edge of the war zone. Is this the first face-to-face -face meeting after a year of remote meetings? Why is this face-to-face -face so important? Well, there's nothing like face-to-face -face discussions, particularly uh, with our military counterparts. It's been hard for the two of them to find time to meet face-to-face. -face. I mean, uh, the, the Ukrainian general there, the chief of the army staff, he's uh, involved in literally fighting uh, for the life of his country. And so I think General Milley was sensitive to that, to, to the needs for him to be on the battlefield. Uh, but they were able to uh, find a, a chance for a brief period for the two of them to meet because they were both so close uh, and it worked out. And I know General Milley got a lot out of it. And I know he was very grateful uh, that the general was willing to meet him there. Uh, the Kremlin has criticized many of the war efforts that we've talked about already. Are you concerned that Russia could at some point get frustrated by all of this and target the U.S. or a NATO ally, perhaps? There's no indication that Russia is interested in attacking a NATO nation or the United States. They are devoting all of their energy inside Ukraine, and it is a lot of energy. The vast majority of their ground forces are involved in the fighting in Ukraine. They have expended thousands uh, of missiles, ballistic, cruise missiles, uh, and short-range missiles uh, inside uh, Ukraine, and they continue to do it, as we saw over the weekend, in these devastating attacks uh, on civilian targets. Uh, they have put a lot of energy into Ukraine, uh, and they have shown no indication that they're uh, that they're interested in fighting outside Ukraine. John Kirby from the White House. Thank you so much, Mr. Kirby. Appreciate your time and insight. My, my pleasure. Thank you. Darius Miles, the University of Alabama basketball player charged with murder, according to new documents, did not shoot the 23-year-old victim, but did provide the handgun used. The player admitted to giving the weapon to the alleged shooter shortly before the shooting. The victim, Jamia Janae Harris, died shortly after being struck while sitting in the passenger seat of a stopped vehicle. Miles is being held without bond at the Tus Tuscaloosa County Jail. We're getting dramatic new video from the deadly ISIS-inspired truck attack along a highway in New York City. Jurors were showing footage of the suspect running through the street with apparent weapons before an officer shot and wounded him. He's on trial for killing eight people and injuring many more on the Halloween of 2017. Our Aaron Katursky has the new images tonight. It was the deadly terror attack that horrified New York City and the country on Halloween in 2017. Oh and tonight we're seeing this video for the first time capturing the dramatic conclusion. Sefalo Saipov had driven a rented pickup truck on a busy bike path, running down and killing eight people. We got multiple casualties. This is a mass casualty situation here. The attack ended when he crashed the truck, seen here, into a school bus and then emerged holding a gun in each hand. Prosecutors said he started screaming, Allahu Akbar. The guns were fake, but Saipov waved them threateningly, bringing traffic to a halt and prompting police to take aim. Saipov was shot several times. Wow. You can see him here drop to the ground. Central, we have one in custody. Saipov survived and is now on trial, charged with carrying out the attack so he could become a member of ISIS. The defense conceding it wasn't an accident, he did it intentionally. But the defense said Saipov pleaded not guilty because he didn't want to join ISIS. He wanted to die a martyr. Aaron Katursky joins us now. And Aaron, you're actually standing at the intersection where the attack ended. What can we expect to hear during the rest of this trial? Prosecutors still have a lot more evidence to prove that Cephalo Saipov Lindsay acted not only with inspiration from ISIS, but because he wanted to join ISIS, become a full-fledged member of the Islamic State. And if he is convicted of the federal charges, he could face the death penalty. Lindsay? All right. Aaron Katursky for us. Our thanks to you, Aaron. 
Back overseas where there's a search for answers after a horrific plane crash in Nepal that killed all 72 people on board. Investigators are now examining the black boxes to try to figure out why the pilot reportedly asked to switch runways just before landing. ABC's Britt Clenet reports tonight from Nepal. Tonight, experts from France are on the ground in Nepal investigating why Yeti Airlines Flight 691 banked sharply to its left and crashed into a thousand foot deep gorge Sunday, just one minute before landing. Ambulance after ambulance showing just how many lives were lost in this horrific crash. At the hospital where families received the bodies of loved ones, I met the uncle and father of the captain. We as it is are exhausted. I'm sure. Physically, <laughs> mentally, emotionally. ABC News has learned that captain and co-pilot both underwent training in the US. The 27-minute flight carrying 72 souls coming from Kathmandu, crashing outside the resort city of Pokhara. Flying around the Himalayas is some of the most treacherous flying in the world. But in this case, it was a perfectly clear day. An airport spokesman reportedly said the pilot requested to switch runways just before the crash, and the request was granted. Pokhara's airport is surrounded by mountainous terrain and opened just two weeks ago. Since 2000, some 350 people have died in plane or helicopter crashes in Nepal. Their training is not to expected levels, and the way that they conduct themselves in flying is not up to standards in Europe or in the United States. Authorities say there's still one body unaccounted for, and Lindsay, in a tragic twist of fate, the co-pilot reportedly became a pilot after her husband, who had been a pilot for the same airline, also died in a plane crash 16 years earlier. Lindsay? Britt, thank you. Marvel star Jeremy Renner is out of the hospital two weeks after sustaining serious injuries in a snowplow accident. The actor responded to a tweet about his Paramount Plus television series Mayor of Kingstown, saying he is back home with his family recovering. Renner was hospitalized on New Year's Day, admitted in critical condition after he was actually accidentally run over by his snowplow while digging out a stuck car on the property of his Lake Tahoe home. And tennis star Chris Everett announced today that she is cancer-free. The update comes one year after going public with a stage 1C ovarian cancer diagnosis. In a piece for ESPN, the 18-time Grand Slam champion said that it was her sister Jean who saved her life. Everett, who lost her sister in 2020, revealed doctors discovered her cancer early from a genetic map her sister left. Next tonight to the coast-to-coast -coast storm barreling across the country. 15 states are on high alert as California is still reeling from the week's-long parade of storms. Our chief meteorologist Ginger Z is tracking it all for us. Hey, Ginger. Hey there, Lindsay. Flagstaff, Arizona has already had more than two feet since the weekend, and they're still in that winter storm warning, but those extend all the way through Colorado and Iowa. The winter storm watches, which is just a function of time, they will become warnings, likely, some of them, extend to Alpena, Michigan. Let's focus in on how and when this is going to go down. So the low pressure system wraps up, and tonight through early tomorrow, it's bad for Denver, Fort Collins, I-25 there. If you're traveling that, the visibility could be reduced significantly because you could have up to a foot of snow, but also 30 30 plus mile per hour winds. Then put this forward in time. Look at the clock. It's 5 p.m. and the storms erupt and they could be damaging w winds and tornadoes anywhere from western Kentucky down to Lake Charles, Louisiana. Now on the back side of that low, it keeps wrapping. And so Iowa gets it, Rochester, Minnesota, parts of Wisconsin. But then it's the warm front here that's going to make mostly a rainstorm. And Lindsay, this has really been a remarkably warm start to the year. Second on record start to the year as far as mild goes in New York City. And speaking of, we haven't had measurable snow in Philadelphia or New York City yet this season. If we go past January 29th in New York, that's the latest on record. It's been 313 days since we've had measurable snow. Does not look good for getting it by the end of this month. 313 days, but who's counting? I'm certainly not uh, <laughs> concerned about getting that snow anytime soon. But Ginger, our thanks to you. And when we come back, a four-year-old boy seen waving a loaded gun, then pulling the trigger. A neighbor describes the terrifying moment that she says he turned the gun on her. Plus, the search for the man police say tried to kidnap a barista by dragging her through a drive through window. First, it's about more than just keeping fumes off the roads. Our Karen Travers examines how the rise in electric school buses could make a huge difference in the health of future generations. 
here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. Here at the White House. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes! And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're going to love it. Bring your friends. Bring them on. If only there was a place in the morning to start my day. With a smile, somewhere to help me get in the know. A place as spectacular as, well, me. Hmm, I think we might know a place, right, guys? Bring your oh, wait, there is. Good morning, America. GMA, 7A, every day. Boom. 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 Good morning, Michael. Good morning, Robin. Good morning, America. How are you? Boom. Now that's how you start your day, people. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? <laughs> Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 12 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. With so much happening these days, it's hard to keep up. Things change hour by hour, minute by minute. The historic weather that's now unfolding. The worries on Wall Street. We're bringing you the right now. At a nationwide teacher shortage. The right now look at the day ahead. An alert this morning for dog owners and the key takeaways from the biggest stories. World News Now and America This Morning, America's number one early morning news. Today does feel a little different. Early mornings on ABC News Live. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. So, what's good to read? And we mean really good to read right now. Well, that's where Charlie and Kate Gibson can help. Join us for the new podcast series. It is called The Bookcase with Kate and Charlie. We will make sure you love what you read. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Ready for a good show? I'm Phil Grucci. The fireworks by Grucci. No matter how big, no matter how small, it is dangerous. It's not a paycheck. It's our life. Take a look at this video. Police say it shows a man trying to abduct a barista at a drive through in Washington state. Officials say that he attempted to drag her through the window using a zip tie. The victim was able to fight him off, thankfully, a few hours ago. With the help of the community, police were able to make an arrest. School districts across the country are beginning to roll out electric buses to get children to and from school with a big boost from the federal government to the tune of $5 billion from the 2021 bipartisan infrastructure law. The vehicles are quieter and better, better for the environment and children's health, devoid of the black smoke and diesel fumes long synonymous with the nearly 500,000 buses on the road today. ABC's Karen Travers has a look at the technology and how it could transform how 25 million American children get to and from school every day. It's a familiar sight and smell, the black smoke and diesel fumes pouring out of the nearly 500,000 school buses that shuttle 25 million American kids to and from school every day. The wheels on this bus go round and round, but with an electric engine powering them, they're practically the only things making noise. So Sheila, we, we really don't hear anything right now. You don't. If anything, all I hear is the heater going. The heater is the largest that we have right now. We just have a little click on it. Sheila Martinez has been driving school buses in Montgomery County, Maryland, just outside the nation's capital, for eight years. Can you please tell Mr. B say we are, we are coming back? Last year, she made the switch from a diesel-powered vehicle to one that runs on electricity. It's quiet, it's smooth, the AC work great, mm -hmm. the heat work great, and it's perfect. Across the nation, many school districts are electrifying their fleets. It's now law in Maryland that by 2025, all newly purchased school buses are electric. New York is doing the same by 2027. 
Officials say key goals are to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and reduce the dirty fumes kids, parents and drivers have been inhaling for decades. The kids are on a bus more than half an hour. So of course it's healthy for them, yes. Experts say school buses are a great fit for electrification. Drivers have a set route in the morning and in the afternoon, and they go relatively short distances. And the buses can sit parked in the lot all day in between, charging up. In 2021, Montgomery County Schools ordered the single biggest fleet of electric school buses in the nation. They'll have 326 on the road in two years. In 10 years, they'll have an entirely electric fleet. Dr. Monifa McKnight is the Montgomery County Schools superintendent. She tells us it was students who led the initial charge to make the county's 1400 buses electric. Our students would come and testify at board meetings and really um, push us to reflect on how we were improving our carbon footprint. The buses shuttling kids to Montgomery County Schools burn 17,000 gallons of diesel fuel a day. The district aims to cut its emissions by 80% by 2027 and 100% by 2035, in part by electrifying its fleet. Some school districts that are making the shift to electric buses are getting a big boost from the federal government. Hundreds of thousands of our children will no longer be inhaling exhaust from diesel school buses. The bipartisan infrastructure law, a signature piece of legislation from the Biden administration, includes $5 billion for clean school buses. The EPA has already given out nearly a billion dollars to hundreds of school districts across the country, helping them make the transition to clean buses. But the government requires applicants to also scrap their diesel buses, sometimes making it difficult for school districts who don't own their own vehicles to get any of that money. There seems to be a real awakening that electric is what the future is going to be for the student transportation industry. Kevin Matthews is the head of electrification at First Student, the largest operator of school buses in North America. He tells us that every school bus that transports students takes 35 cars off the road. So then when you convert that to zero emissions, the air quality improvement is even significantly higher. Uh, so the overall benefits are quite high for the environment, for the children, and for the communities where the school buses operate. Children whose lungs are still developing are particularly vulnerable to the fumes from diesel exhaust. Recent studies have shown that when kids are exposed to less diesel emissions, their lungs function better, they're absent from school less, and they even have slightly higher test scores. When we remove diesel emissions, uh, we see the health implications, um, but we're also reducing the exacerbation that we see from transportation climate change and global warming. EPA Administrator Michael Regan says that without the infrastructure law funding, it would likely take decades longer for schools to make this transition. This is an awesome opportunity for us to electrify our transportation system, really ramp up our manufacturing, uh, but also solve very serious environmental and health disparities. Montgomery County Public Schools tells us there's been no additional cost from switching to electric buses, thanks in part to the thousands of dollars they save on diesel fuel each day. And as a superintendent, I always try to reflect on what are the needs of our district and where are places that we are able to save. We're building trust with our community by showing them that we're being fiscally responsible. That investment is on display every day when Sheila Martinez spends hours on her electric bus, shuttling elementary, middle and high school students throughout the county. Do the kids realize they're on something different, that it's different than the old buses or the buses that some of their schoolmates might be on? They do. Actually, they, they love it. The kids love it. Still ahead here on Prime, the major drugstore now lifting restrictions on the purchase of over-the-counter medicines for children. He's known for his viral takes on ESPN, but Stephen A. Smith tells us he's now opening up about challenges that he faced during his childhood and finding his passion for sports reporting. And a summit for some of the world's richest and most well-connected leaders, but what exactly happens there? We take a closer look at the annual World Economic Forum in Davos by the numbers. But first, our tweet of the day. This tweet and video from none other than Madonna announcing her the celebration tour, combining four time. decades of a music and greatest hits all in Madonna. one concert. The Celebration Tour. Four decades of music featuring her greatest hits.
much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. With so much at stake in our world right now, we wanted to thank you for your trust and for making ABC News America's number one news. And thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. This is where I belong. This is home. Real dirt in the sunlight again. I'm very excited. Anything could happen at any moment. My heart is so happy right now. We're making magic. We're making magic. Grammy-winning artist Megan Thee Stallion. Megan was a victim of a crime. The woman was shot, wound up in the hospital. Rapper accused of shooting Megan Thee Stallion. Tori Lanez is accused of shooting her after a night out. Megan Thee Stallion and the trial of Tori Lanez. There were times that she wished that he had just killed her so she wouldn't have to have gone through what she went through in the last two years. This is Impact by Nightline. Stay strong, Megan. Thank you. Meg, how do you feel? Now streaming only on Hulu. Zoo! 200! Oh, 200! 200 episodes of Dr. Pole. Oh. Music to my ears. It's been 10 years, and I'm still having the fun. That rocks. He's got the moves that make your animals groove. Now we do the dance of joy. Yay. He's like the Justin Bieber of the <laughs> Headlining the hottest barns. Shut out. It's a show you won't want to miss. I'm not going to be here forever. Maybe. <laughs> the Incredible Dr. Pole. New episodes Saturdays at 9 on Nat Geo Wild. This is ABC News Live Prime. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Live reporting, breaking news, exclusives, award-winning, powerful, eye-opening. ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis. Streaming weeknights. So, what's good to read? And we mean really good to read right now. Well, that's where Charlie and Kate Gibson can help. Join us for the new podcast series. It is called The Bookcase with Kate and Charlie. We will make sure you love what you read. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. From America's number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter. And it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. Reporting from New York, I'm Monaco Sarabdi. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back, everyone. The world's rich and well-connected are gathering for the annual World Economic Forum in Davos. Let's take a look by the numbers. Nearly 2,700 heads of state, corporate CEOs, media bigwigs, and academics from 130 countries have descended on the Swiss mountain resort of Davos this week. It's the first time in three years that a full lineup of panels, debates, and glitzy dinners and parties are back on the schedule in the wake of the pandemic. But while some 40 heads of state are scheduled to attend, only one leader of a G8 nation, Germany, Chancellor Olaf Scholz will be in Davos this year. Perched at more than 5,000 feet above sea level, the annual Alpine Conclave of the Rich and Famous has been all decked out for the gathering with everything except snow. There were zero inches of accumulation until this week when the white stuff did start to fall just in time. But the winter snowpack has thinned some 40% since 1971 when the first forum met, according to Bloomberg. And the trend is the same across the Alps. Perhaps it's a fitting backdrop. More than one in three Davos panel discussions this year are linked to climate change, but some critics are crying hypocrisy. That's because some 1,040 private jets flew in and out of the Davos area for last year's scaled-down gathering of the powerful quadrupling local emissions, according to The Guardian. Some 53% of those flights were short-haul flights under 500 miles. In response, this year, forum organizers are offering a 50% discount on train tickets within Europe, but skeptics point out that discounted train travel may not move the needle for those high-flying Davos attendees. And we still have lots to get to here on Prime tonight. What's cutting kind of off the town's water, sending the community to desperately search for another source? Plus, how a veteran used his Marine Corps training to help track down an abducted dog. But first, look at our top trending stories on abcnews.com. With so 
much happening these days, it's hard to keep up. Things change hour by hour, minute by minute. The historic weather that's now unfolding. The worries on Wall Street. We're bringing you the right now. But a nationwide teacher shortage. The right now look at the day ahead. An alert this morning for dog owners. And the key takeaways from the biggest stories. World News Now and America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. Today does feel a little different. Early mornings on ABC News Live. This is where I belong. This is home. Real dirt in the sunlight again. I'm very excited. Anything could happen at any moment. My heart is so happy right now. We're making magic. We're making magic. Grammy-winning artist Megan Thee Stallion. Megan was a victim of a crime. A woman was shot, wound up in the hospital. Rapper accused of shooting Megan Thee Stallion. Tory Lanez is accused of shooting her after a night out. Megan Thee Stallion and the trial of Tory Lanez. There were times that she wished that he had just killed her so she wouldn't have to have gone through what she went through in the last two years. This is Impact by Nightline. Stay strong, Megan. Thank you. Meg, how do you feel? Now streaming only on Hulu. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes! And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're gonna love it. Now streaming on ABC News Live 2020. True crime, cinematic, real-life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime 2020. Now streaming on ABC News Live. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 12 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. not the most current dance, but I do it really well. First time I've been in a place that I love doing something that I love. With people that you love? No, I didn't say that. Come on, y'all, make some noise. I'm Turk Janine. Janine. Gregory. Um, Ava. Ava's here. Sorry, I don't speak line. Video from Indiana showing a toddler waving a loaded gun outside his apartment. Beach Grove police say the boy was holding a semi-automatic Smith & Wesson, then pulled the trigger, though the gun did not fire. The boy at the time was with his father. He was arrested and charged with felony neglect of a dependent. The child was released to his mother's care. A downstairs neighbor told ABC News that the boy had pointed the gun at her. He was at the top of the stairs, and he kind of leaned down, and um, that's when he pointed the gun at me and said, Look what I got. Um, and kind of laughed. Ha ha. Jury selection today in a class action lawsuit against Elon Musk. It's Elon Musk versus Tesla investors in this class action lawsuit in the San Francisco courtroom. In 2018, long before he claimed he would buy Twitter and take it private, Elon Musk tweeted that he lined up financing to pay for a $72 billion buyout of his electric car company, Tesla. Stocks rallied and then halted once it was clear that deal was not happening. Musk eventually settled with the SEC for $40 million and as part of that agreement stepped down as chairman. Investors who owned Tesla stock during that 10-day period in August of 2018 are a part of this suit. 
Officials in Scottsdale, Arizona, leaving homeowners outside the city limits high and dry, cutting them off from getting their water from the city after years of access. Officials say persistent drought has forced them to take the drastic measure in order to conserve water for those who live within the city limits. Arizona is one of 33 states currently experiencing moderate or worse drought conditions. The Scottsdale cutoff, affecting roughly 1,000 households in Rio Verde foothills. The city of Scottsdale telling ABC News that for nearly a decade, they've warned Rio Verde foothills residents about this possibility. Walgreens saying it has lifted limits on purchases of over-the-counter pediatric fever-reducing medicines. The pharmacy giant said improved in-stock conditions of the medications allowed it to remove its online-only purchase limit. The move comes after months of rising demand for children's cold and flu medicine with multiple viruses spreading, causing shortages in available medicines and prompting major pharmacy chains to limit how much customers could buy at a time. Meanwhile, Rite Aid told ABC News it planned to lift its own limits by the end of this week, but CVS said its current limits were still in place. The stars of the hit reality show Chris Lee Knows Best reporting to prison to serve a combined 19-year sentence for bank fraud and tax evasion. Todd Chris Lee serving his 12-year sentence at federal prison camp Pensacola in Florida, while Julie will spend the next seven years at a minimum security satellite camp in Lexington, Kentucky. Their case still under appeal. Federal prosecutors say the couple swindled at least $30 million from community banks between 2007 and 2012. A jury finding them guilty on all charges. Their hit reality show Chris Lee Knows Best premiered in 2014 and followed the life and times of the real estate tycoon and his family. It gives me immense personal pride as the Vice President of the United States to say Dub Nation is in the house. Vice President and Bay Area native Kamala Harris welcomed the NBA champion Golden State Warriors to the White House. The ceremony honored the team's fourth title in eight years, though they skipped White House visits in 2017 and 2018 when then-President Trump was in office. President Biden complimented their work on and off the court. Look at what this team does, speaking out against racism, standing up for equality. NBA Finals MVP Steph Curry presented the president and vice president with their own jerseys. We are a team. We do it together. And to be able to celebrate our championship together with you here, it means a lot. His fans know him for his hot takes and big personality on ESPN's first take. But in his new book, Straight Shooter, a memoir of second chances and first takes, Stephen A. Smith opens up about his childhood, a dream playing basketball cut short, and finding his passion in sports reporting. Stephen A. Smith in the house, ladies and gentlemen. It's good to see you. How you doing? So good to have you yeah. here. Let's start with mom. Uh, you talk about how she worked two jobs, supporting six kids, uh, and, and her strong influence on you. Just give us a sense of, of her fingerprints on, on your life. Everything. Uh, she's the greatest woman I've ever known, and she's the one person on the planet that I knew beyond a shadow of a doubt loved me unconditionally. And so um, everything that I do every day that I walk this earth is in an effort to make her proud and to make her proud of the fact that I kind of followed the path that she wanted me to follow. You know, it's one thing to be successful, but to go from getting left back in the fourth grade mm. to becoming a successful journalist, that's a bit different. And so um, she had a lot to do with that, her unwavering faith in me, her belief in me, her tireless efforts for me, uh, the manner in which she held me accountable, all of those things came into play and to know what she had to endure in order to do those things just made me revere her that, that much more. And, and you talk, I want to quote here, that you write that your mom told you, own what you say and do, stand on it, even if the fallout is something that is not in your favor. Uh, your book is obviously entitled Straight Shooter. Uh, tell us about why those qualities are, are so essential for you. Well, because, you know, first of all, the title of the book, Straight Shooter, is a dedication to her because mm -hmm. that's the kind of person that she was. She meant few words and she let you know exactly where she stood and why. But when you bring up the words that you just brought up, my mother was a firm believer, as private as she was and as much as she didn't want people knowing her business, she was very, very big on if you were going to open your mouth, speak your truth, therefore you're not a prisoner to somebody else's interpretation 
collection of things. You know what you said. You know what you are. You've articulated. You know what you stand on and why. And that's for other people to decide and contemplate whether they want to live with that or not, as opposed to you harboring that energy inside of yourself, or harnessing that energy inside of yourself, where it serves to bring you down because you're expending a bit too much energy, worried about what everybody else is going to think, instead of letting it out and letting them worry about your truths. It, when you talk about pursuing your passion, some people use, and, and perhaps fairly in some cases, a learning disability as mm -hmm. a reason they can't achieve, right? Uh, you talk about growing up undiagnosed dyslexia. What was it about? Maybe it was mom again, yep. but that made you overcome that. Well, it's a combination of mom, definitely, but my dad was a motivating force in his, in his own uh, different kind of way because he didn't believe in me at all. Kids just minutes earlier were in the neighborhood laughing at me. I remember their name. I remember their mm -hmm. faces. They told me I wouldn't be able to be a journalist. I pulled it off. They told me I'd never become a columnist. I pulled it off. They told me I would never make it on television. I pulled it off. And I've been the star of the number one sports morning show for 11 consecutive years. And by the way, I've got plans in the future as well that I'm going for because I don't look at anybody's stop sign that they place in front of me. I create my own stop sign. You talk about one thing that you promise to your viewers is that you're gonna be your authentic Stephen A. Smith, right? Yeah. You stand by your words. I am curious, because you do get into it with some pretty uh, great detail, sure. uh, the moment where Aisha Curry had tweeted about how the game was rigged yeah. and whatever, and you kind of went in a little bit about her and made the comparison between her and, and LeBron James's wife, and, and people told you they didn't, they, they didn't like that. Right. What, are there ever moments like that, for example, that you say, ah, I was authentic, but maybe I wasn't right, or maybe I would take it back, or oh, yeah. I would say it differently. Several times, several times in my career where, you know, my, my issue is, and you know what, the more serious one was the Ray Rice scandal. Mm -hmm. uh, with Aisha Curry, it was simply, what I regretted most was that people thought it was a gender issue with me. And my thought was, I should have made sure to say, Hillary Rodham Clinton's running for president. If Bill Clinton got into some trouble, man, you got to protect your wife. You can't, you can't jeopardize her aspirations. It's about the, the loved it's one. It's about the loved one, right? But I didn't clarify. I wasn't clear enough. And Laura Gentile, who was a, a marvelous, marvelous, who's a marvelous executive at ESPN, running ESPNW, she made the point, well, Stephen, you know what? There's two men on the air talking about how a woman should act. You don't think that would be something that's uncomfortable? And I was like... Never thought about it that way. Because as a black person, if I saw two white folks talking about what black people should do and how black people should feel, how I have a problem with it. So I definitely understood that. I understood the same thing with the whole Shoei Otani situation, how I didn't clarify my thoughts about a foreigner who was a major league baseball player being marketed by major league baseball. It's my job to articulate my thoughts clearly enough so there is no ambiguity. I didn't do a good enough job there. And so that's really, those are the kind of things that you're talking about. And that's where, yeah, I could look at it and say, I could have done this or that better, but my intent, right. I believe, was honorable, and I stand on that. It, there are so many times, in particular in, in recent years, where you have sports and, and politics and race intersect, and quite often, viewers look to you for your perspective, your take, uh, for the speaking really on behalf of the black community in, yes. some, in, in some cases, a lot of pressure, certainly. I'm wondering if you view that as a, as a blessing, a burden, both? Both. Uh, it's a blessing because the reality of the situation is when you look at the history of the black community, on far too many occasions, we've lamented the fact that we didn't have a big enough bullhorn. We weren't, uh, we didn't have a big enough voice because we weren't giving that platform. Um, so certainly on far many occasions, too many of us have been able to have that kind of complaint. So the fact that I have that platform available to me now is definitely a privilege that I don't take lightly. Before we let you go, of course, we're right in the middle of the NFL playoffs. Yeah. Can you get a little hot take from you? Uh, obviously, Dallas Cowboys, your yes. favorite team. Oh, Lord. Right? They won last uh, night. Yeah. Uh, who, who are you, who's your pick? Well, props to the Dallas Cowboys, because <laughs> I certainly thought that Tom Brady would find a way to escape with a victory. Uh, he did not. Uh, he was awful uh, that particular night. I still think he's one of the better quarterbacks in the NFL, but last night was clearly not his shining moment. Having said that, I expect the Dallas Cowboys to lose to the San Francisco 49ers this weekend. I expect the Philadelphia Eagles to beat the Giants. I expect San Francisco and Philadelphia to meet in the NFC Championship game for the right to go to the Super Bowl. If Jalen Hurts is healthy, I think Philadelphia should have a slight edge. If he is compromised in any way, San Francisco goes to the Super Bowl. I think it comes down to Kansas City against San Francisco.
in all likelihood, uh, and we'll see what happens then. I, I, maybe I'll come back on to give my prediction, but I'm not going to give it now. As a girl from South Jersey, I was waiting for the Eagles. Fly, Eagles, fly. They got a chance. Hey. They got a chance. They got a chance. <laughs> Stephen A. Smith, we thank you so much. Want to let you. our viewers know that your book, Straight Shooter Memoir of Second Chances and First Takes, is available now wherever books are sold. An Iraq war veteran used his expertise in the field to track down a suspected dog napper and get the beloved pet home to its family. Our Eva Pilgrim has this story. A stolen Yorkie back home thanks to the help of an Iraq war veteran. Richard McAmer says the intelligence training he learned as a Marine helped him track down the dog nappers and the pup. There are so many, so many rabbit holes you go down. Raquel Witherspoon's Yorkie, Avery, was taken from her front yard. This doorbell camera video, part of the police investigation in the case, showing a person walking up, luring the dog with snacks. Soon after, another person appears, both walking away with Avery. He's a family member. He's my grandson, and that's her son. And we had him for three years. He means the world to us. Witherspoon posted these missing dog posters around her neighborhood. That's when someone began sending threatening text messages and this video, appearing to show Avery locked in a cage. The texter demanding $1,200. And the news just happened to flash up a reward poster. I texted her at, at that number and told her that uh, I could help if she wanted it. McAmer got to work. He ran the dog napper's number through an online database, attempted to extract geolocation data from pictures and video, nothing. I hail, hail married it and put the, the dog napper's phone number into my personal phone, which is connected to my Instagram account. And probably three to four hours later, the Instagram recommended that I follow an account associated with that phone number. The Marine veteran using that account to find someone who looks similar in the doorbell video. Police eventually arresting a 16 year old in the theft and bringing Avery back home. This dog napping just one of thousands nationwide. Dog thefts increasing by 30% since 2021. The threat even extending to celebrities like Lady Gaga, whose dog walker was shot as thieves made off with two of her French bulldogs. They were returned two days later. It's a demand for a certain breed. Some people steal for themselves. Some people steal to resell the dog and some people steal just because they can. And before we go tonight, the image of the day, flowers resting on the Hollywood fame star of actress and Italian film legend Gina Lola Brigida, once dubbed the most beautiful woman in the world. The sign next to her star reads, quote, rest in peace, La Lola. And that is our show for this hour. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. Thanks so much for streaming with us. the next hour staying on top of a few things who's now set to inherit elvis presley's famous 120 acre estate after the death of his daughter lisa marie and it's something that many women don't want to think about being the victim of a drugging but we have some tips what you should do if you're ever in this terrifying situation with so much at stake in our world right now we wanted to thank you for your trust and for making ABC News America's number one news. And thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. After an extraordinary newsmaking year, thank you for making ABC's This Week America's number one news and politics show on Sunday mornings. You never know what you're going to get on this show. That's all I'm going to tell you. Yes, Whoopi! This mic on! Can you hear me out there? Behind the scenes is always a better show. Absolutely. Always. Absolutely. That's what people don't see during the commercial break. Right. They don't. What happened? I had no idea really what I was getting myself into. That day that we walked out, I, I treasured that day. I just, I couldn't sit there. You're doing good, Joy. You're doing good. Oh, yeah, baby. It was crazy. Behind the Table. Listen wherever you get your podcasts.
From America's number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter. And it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. We're honored. ABC's 2020 winner of three Emmy Awards for Excellence. Thank you for making 2020 Friday night's most watched and most honored news magazine. This is where I belong. This is home. Real dirt in the sunlight again. I'm very excited. Anything could happen at any moment. My heart is so happy right now. We're making magic. We're making magic. Lindsay Davis, thank you so much for streaming with us. We're monitoring several developments here at ABC News at this hour. Take a look at this video. Police say it shows a man trying to abduct a barista at a drive through in Washington State. Officials say that he attempted to drag her through the window using a zip tie. The victim was able to fight him off, thankfully, with the help of the community. Police were able to make an arrest. Former adult film star Ron Jeremy was found mentally incompetent to stand trial on rape and other charges involving 21 alleged victims. The ruling comes after Jeremy, whose real name is Ronald Jeremy Hyatt, was ordered to undergo a pair of psychiatric exams after one of his attorneys questioned his mental competency when his client couldn't determine who he was. Prosecutors allege that the crimes involving alleged victims ranging in age from 15 to 51 occurred over a 23-year span. Jeremy has pleaded not guilty. Lisa Marie Presley's three daughters will inherit a trust that includes Graceland, according to uh, a representative for Graceland. The iconic estate is located in Memphis, Tennessee. Lisa Marie Presley died on January 12 after being rushed to the hospital. The singer-songwriter is the only child of singer and actor Elvis Presley and businesswoman Priscilla Presley. A former Republican candidate for the New Mexico State House is under arrest in connection with brazen political violence against four Democratic officials. Authorities say that he was the mastermind behind a conspiracy where four men were paid to shoot up the homes of Democratic officials. The arrest comes amid growing number of threats to elected officials from both parties. Mola Lange is in Albuquerque for us tonight. Tonight, authorities say the man approaching this front door is a Republican who lost his election in New Mexico in a landslide, showing up at the homes of state and county Democratic leaders after the election, angry and falsely claiming the election was somehow rigged. Hi, my name is Solomon Pena. Police say 39-year-old Solomon Pena arrived at this home looking for one of his alleged targets. Police say over the course of four weeks, four homes were sprayed with bullets. In one home, blasting right through a state lawmaker's 10-year-old daughter's bedroom. All of these homes where Democrats lived. Police say Pena hired hitmen to take aim at the homes and that Pena fired at one of them himself. Tonight, Pena is under arrest. Police and SWAT teams moving in 24 hours ago in Albuquerque. Officials saying the failed Republican politician was an election denier who police say hired those four hitmen paying them with cash and providing them with weapons. These shootings were orchestrated. They were dangerous attacks, not only to these individuals, but fundamentally also to democracy. The targets, two state legislators and two county commissioners. Officials say the plot was fueled by Pena's anger over his loss for that state house seat. He'd reportedly been in state prison for seven years for burglary, a judge allowing him to run for office. He had complaints about his election. He felt it was rigged. He's an election denier. He doesn't want to accept the results of the election. The first shooting was on December 4th, when authorities say County Commissioner Adrian Barboa's home was struck repeatedly by gunfire, like, telling us today... My home was shot up for shots directly through my front door, right through my living room where I had just... A few hours before, I've been playing with my grandbaby. Authorities say fortunately no one was injured in any of the shootings. The arrest warrant revealing that just hours after the final shooting on January 3rd, police cracked the case wide open when one of Pena's alleged hitmen was pulled over for an expired registration. Police say they found cash, guns, and drugs in that car, and it was registered to Pena. At the end of the day, this was about a right-wing radical an election denier who did the worst imaginable thing you can do when you have a political disagreement, which is turn that to violence. 
Our thanks to MOLA. Now to Washington, where President Biden remains under fire after his lawyers revealed this weekend that five more pages of classified documents were found at his Delaware home. The president ignored questions on the matter when pressed during an Oval Office meeting today. As House Republicans say they'll investigate further. ABC's chief White House correspondent Cecilia Vega has the latest. Sir, why didn't you tell us President Biden today in the Oval Office all smiles as he ignored questions about the growing number of classified documents found in his Delaware home. Over the weekend, the White House revealing they discovered five more pages of classified material last Thursday. The administration now under fire for not disclosing that information sooner. On Friday, you stood here, though, and were asked about this documents issued by our council 18 times. At that point, the president's lawyers had found these five additional pages of classified documents. So did you not know on Friday that those documents had been found when you were at the podium? I have been forthcoming from this podium. What I uh, said yes to was what the statement at the time that we all had. Right, you all had the statement, uh, and I was repeating what the what the uh, council was sharing at that time. The press secretary finally acknowledging she didn't know the new documents had been found. I provided the information that you all had How at the time, and I know? confirmed. No, I did not know. House Republicans who have launched their own investigations today attacking President Biden for taking months to admit he kept classified documents from the Obama administration. This is why there's such hypocrisy behind the Bidens once again, something big that comes forward prior to an election where they kind of keep it quiet, where the American public could actually have a say. In. Now the White House accusing Republicans of their own brand of hypocrisy, noting they showed little interest in investigating Donald Trump, who took hundreds of classified documents to his Mar-a-Lago home and repeatedly refused to hand them over to the FBI. In contrast, the Biden team has been cooperating with the Justice Department from the start. Our thanks to Cecilia. The husband of a Massachusetts mother of three who's been missing since New Year's Day has been charged with murder. The news comes while he was already in police custody for allegedly misleading investigators. ABC Stephanie Ramos has those details. Tonight, the husband of that Massachusetts mother of three who vanished more than two weeks ago on New Year's Day, now charged with her murder. The continued investigation has now allowed police to obtain an arrest warrant charging Brian Walsh with the murder of his wife. Brian Walsh, already in police custody for allegedly misleading investigators after Anna Walsh went missing. He's pleaded not guilty. Anna, last seen by a relative in the early hours of January 1st, leaving her Boston area home for a flight to Washington, D.C. that investigators say she never boarded. Authorities launching an exhaustive search after she was reported missing by both her husband and her employer. Police finding a bloody knife in the basement of the family's Cohasset home. Authorities also allege Walsh said the day after his wife disappeared, he left the house to only get a treat for their son, but surveillance footage capturing him at this Home Depot. Sometime after 4 o'clock, went to the Home Depot. He's on surveillance at that time, purchasing about $450 worth of cleaning supplies. That would include mops, bucket, tops, um, TVEX, uh, drop cloths, uh, as well as various kinds of tape. Our thanks to Stephanie for that dramatic new video from the deadly ISIS-inspired truck attack along a highway in New York City. The assailant is on trial for killing eight people and injuring many more on Halloween of 2017. Jurors were shown video of him running through the street with apparent weapons before an officer shot and wounded him. Our Aaron Katursky has the new images tonight. It was the deadly terror attack that horrified New York City and the country on Halloween in 2017. Oh and tonight we're seeing this video for the first time capturing the dramatic conclusion. Cephalo Saipov had driven a rented pickup truck on a busy bike path, running down and killing eight people. We got multiple casualties. This is a mass casualty situation here. The attack ended when he crashed the truck, seen here, into a school bus and then emerged holding a gun in each hand. Prosecutors said he started screaming, Allahu Akbar. The guns were fake, but Saipov waved them threateningly, bringing traffic to a halt and prompting police to take aim. Saipov was shot several times. Wow. You can see him here drop to the ground. Saipov survived and is now on trial, charged with carrying out the attack so he could become a member of ISIS. The defense conceding it wasn't an accident, he did it intentionally. But the defense said Saipov pleaded not guilty because he didn't want to join ISIS, he wanted to die a martyr. 
Our thanks to Aaron. We head overseas now to the war in Ukraine where the ruthless bloodshed is intensifying. This time an apparent building demolished by a missile made to sink aircraft carriers. As the mission to protect power plants continues, Matt Gutman is in Dnipro for us tonight. After a Russian missile obliterated this residential building in Dnipro, the death toll tonight rising to at least 45, six of them children. The same salvo of Russian missiles that destroyed the apartment block also targeting critical infrastructure across Ukraine. And in central Ukraine today, we had rare access to one of the country's battered power plants, hit 12 times since July. Wreckage everywhere. He's saying that every time a transformer like this is hit, it takes out power for thousands of families at a time. So precious is electricity that this coal powered plant is now considered a top secret site. One of the managers taking us through yes, yes. Russian missile parts okay. littering the site. And I just want you to see the power of the shrapnel in that missile pinging holes in pure steel. From the destroyed transformers down the gangplank to the main plant, inside, it's enormous. The scale and the size of this machinery almost defies comprehension, but it's something on this scale that is required to provide power to a city. In the control room, the windows packed with sandbags and body armor. He says they were once engineers, but now... The soldiers energy front. They're soldiers on the energy front. Blah, blah. Those rolling blackouts continue. There are thanks to Matt. Earlier, I spoke with White House National Security Spokesperson John Kirby and asked him about the Ukrainian troops now on U.S. soil being trained. Uh, that training has started this weekend uh, here in the United States. That'll take about uh, 10 weeks. Uh, and then there'll be several weeks of this combined arms training that, uh, that we're doing with uh, Ukrainian battalion-sized units. Uh, it'll take several weeks uh, to get them through this combined arms maneuver training. And the idea there is it's not just one and done. We're going to keep battalions coming through that training over the next uh, coming weeks and months. If Western countries are sending Patriot missiles, aircraft, potentially tanks, Ukrainian soldiers are arriving on U.S. soil to train, at what point would you say that the U.S. and its allies are, are just directly in this war with Russia as opposed to simply providing support? We are supporting Ukraine's ability to defend itself and to defend oneself uh, against the threat that they're posed, uh, that Russia poses, continues to pose to them. Uh, you got to have capabilities, uh, air defense, artillery, armor, ammunition. Um, you also have to have the knowledge to use those capabilities. Not Staying overseas now, where there's a search for answers after a horrific plane crash in Nepal that killed all 72 people on board. Investigators are now examining the black boxes to try to figure out why the pilot reportedly asked to switch runways for landing just before the crash. ABC's Britt Clinton reports tonight from Nepal. Tonight, experts from France are on the ground in Nepal, investigating why Yeti Airlines Flight 691 banked sharply to its left and crashed into a thousand foot deep gorge Sunday, just one minute before landing. Ambulance after ambulance showing just how many lives were lost in this horrific crash. At the hospital where families received the bodies of loved ones, I met the uncle and father of the captain. We as it is are exhausted. I'm sure. Physically, <laughs> mentally, emotionally. ABC News has learned that captain and co-pilot both underwent training in the US. The 27-minute flight carrying 72 souls coming from Kathmandu, crashing outside the resort city of Pokhara. Flying around the Himalayas is some of the most treacherous flying in the world. But in this case, it was a perfectly clear day. An airport spokesman reportedly said the pilot requested to switch runways just before the crash, and the request was granted. Pokhara's airport is surrounded by mountainous terrain and opened just two weeks ago. Since 2000, some 350 people have died in plane or helicopter crashes in Nepal. Their training is not to expected levels, and the way that they conduct themselves in flying is not up to standards in Europe or in the United States. Many demanding change there are thanks to Brit. Still to come, why climate activist Greta Thunberg was carried away by police in Germany and exposing the truth behind dangerous black markets. Journalist Mariana Van Zeller tells us what it's like to uncover the world's most illegitimate trades. These informal, these black and gray markets actually make up for almost half of the global economy and yet we know so little about them. This is ABC News Live.
the crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. Here at the White House. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. Bring them on. If only there was a place in the morning to start my day. With a smile, somewhere to help me get in the know. A place as spectacular as, well, me. Hmm, I think we might know a place, right, guys? Bring your friends. Oh, wait, there is. Good morning, America. GMA, 7A, every day. Boom. 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 Good morning, Michael. Good morning, Robin. Good morning, America. How are you? Boom. Now that's how you start your day, people. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? <laughs> Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 12 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Ready for a good show? I'm Phil Grucci of Fireworks by Grucci. No matter how big, no matter how small, it is dangerous. It's not a paycheck. Yeah. It's our life. Now streaming on ABC News Live 2020. True crime, cinematic, real-life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime 2020. Now streaming on ABC News Live. Welcome back. We're tracking several headlines around the world. A climate activist, Greta Thunberg, was carried out and detained by police, along with others, during protests against the demolition of the coal village in Germany. According to a police spokesperson, it was not clear what would happen to Thunberg or the group that she was detained with, or whether an activist who actually jumped into the mine was injured. At least 130 homes have been impacted by a burst of seismic activity in El Salvador, leaving more than a dozen people in shelters. Authorities reported 219 Earth Earthquakes over 48 hours. No deaths have been reported, but the tremors have damaged homes and caused at least 20 landslides. The funeral of Kenyan LGBTQ rights activist Edwin Chiloba uh, took place in his home village in western Kenya. Chiloba's body was discovered in a metal box on the roadside near the city of Eldoret two weeks ago. He died from asphyxiation caused by socks stuffed into his mouth. Police believe Chiloba, a fashion model and designer, was killed at his home in the western Kenyan city and have named his roommate Jack Tone Odiambo, with whom he is thought to have had a relationship with as the main suspect. What happens if you're a victim of drugging? Who should you report this to and what precautions should you take? One woman in Denver went public with her own story and now more are speaking out about this alarming issue. ABC's Eva Pilgrim has the latest reports on drugging or spiked drinks at bars and clubs in Denver. Mia Mainville's New Year's Eve began at a Denver bar surrounded by friends, but then, she says, a stranger drugged her drink. I was not able to focus on anybody. I was not able to have full control of my body. Mainville says she was taken to the ER by ambulance, where doctors told her that hospital toxicology tests aren't able to detect certain illicit drugs, including some that are frequently used to spike drinks, and instead referred her to the Denver Police Department. The officer had told me that um, because I had told him I wasn't assaulted, that there wasn't a reason for them to file a report. Our ABC affiliate Denver 7 reporting that several women are speaking out to them, claiming police aren't taking their cases seriously. I had about 70 women reach out to me telling me that the same thing had happened to them. Colleen Mitchell says she believes she was drugged at a Denver bar in December. I contacted the police. They told me that basically no crime has occurred since I made it home safe and that no assault occurred. Denver police telling ABC it has launched internal investigations into how both Mainville and Mitchell's cases were handled, adding, if an individual believes they have consumed a substance that caused them to become unconscious, they should report the incident to police. There's not an antidote for date rape drugs that is widely available to the public. 
So it's really important to seek medical care right away, um, particularly if you don't know what you've been exposed to. In 2022, Boston police alerting the public about a rise in reported incidents involving spike drinks served at bars and parties, 117 last year alone, according to police. I couldn't stand up. I basically had to sit on the sidewalk and then I just started getting sick, like uncontrollably. Now student groups at universities in Boston are trying to combat this, handing out the nightcap scrunchie, which goes from a wearable hair scrunchie into a drink cover, making it more difficult for someone to spike a drink. So clever there are thanks to Eva for that. The black market is closer than you think. National Geographic's hit docuseries Trafficked with award-winning journalist Mariana Van Zeller returns now for a third season, exposing the truth behind the world's most illegitimate trades. What are the secrets that most people don't know? Let me see your ID card. Wait, 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 wait. This is a world you will have to live in. There's no going back. Mariana takes us inside the most dangerous black markets, traveling around the globe, meeting with both traffickers and victims to better understand this growing industry. ABC's Mona Kosar Abdi sat down with Van Zeller about this latest season. Mariana, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me, Mona. You have the most interesting job. I mean, you've made it your mission to explore the inner workings of the world's most dangerous markets. You even sometimes witness crimes happening in real time. Can you talk to me about how you're able to process those intense moments that you find yourself in? It's not easy. I mean, first of all, it's not easy to get access to these worlds. I mean, it takes a lot of work. It takes months, sometimes even years of just, you know, waiting around for things to happen, knocking on doors, you know, relentlessly pursuing people who live in these underworlds or work, operate in these underworlds that they don't want there to be a light shone on. Ever since I decided I wanted to be a journalist, it really has been a passion of mine. And I think partly it's because I think most people don't know, but these informal, these black and gray markets actually make up for almost half of the global economy economy and yet we know so little about them and they have uh, a, an impact on our daily lives. So for me it's incredibly important to be able to see, sort of witness and show what is happening in these underworlds. It's definitely a secretive underground world. How do you gain their trust for you to share their story with you? I always say that for every yes we get, we get about you know, dozens if not hundreds of no's. Uh, you have to get used to rejection. <laughs> uh, but at the end of the day, I think people say yes for a variety of reasons. I think, you know, there's a, a boasting uh, a part of it uh, where people, you know, s some of the people we meet that I talk to are the best of, of the best of what they do, whether they're making drugs or smuggling guns or scamming people half a world away. And yet sometimes their families don't even know they do it. So we give them an opportunity behind a mass to sort of boast about what they're amazing at. And then I think more importantly than everything is this very human characteristic that we all share of wanting to be understood. Uh, they know that they're considered the bad guys. They're the most stereotyped people in our society, right? I always tell them, I'm not here to judge. I do not condone uh, what you do, but I am here to understand why you do it and to understand your motivation. Because only then will you be able to sort of get an understanding and perhaps prevent these black markets from happening or from existing. Mm. And there is one clip where you're at a crude oil refinery mm -hmm. and you're getting interrogated. One guy is even threatening you um, as lifting up a crude oil bucket and threatening to throw it on you. Yeah. What was going through your head at that moment? It was not a very comfortable situation. Yeah. I explain why, because they are used to multinational corporations, oil corpor corporations that come there, and in their eyes, they are essentially stealing what is rightfully theirs, their oil. I had never seen anything like this. It's burned scorched earth with miles and miles of this black earth where there's hundreds or thousands of people coming in and stealing this oil and refining it illegally from the pipelines of these multinational companies. So they at first thought that we were coming to shut their their operation down and therefore leave you know these hundreds of families with no income and so they weren't happy that we were there so it took some time to sort of explain to them look I'm a journalist and I kept repeating and I'm a journalist I'm from National Geographic you've been reporting for over 15 years but you find yourself in seriously unsafe situations so how do you how do you deal with that being in those situations where you know your safety may be at risk 
Yeah, I always say that no story is worth a life, obviously, so we take our safety uh, very seriously. Uh, there's a lot of training, there's a lot of planning that goes beforehand before we even set foot in the field. But I think staying calm is very, very important, and I think that showing people respect and trust goes a long way. Is it in the back of your head, though? You know, you're traveling in these situations as a woman and going in to, mm -hmm. you know, talk to smugglers. Uh, drug dealers. Yeah. Is that always in the back of your head? It is, but I actually think being a woman really has helped me um, throughout my life and this uh, crazy job that I've picked for myself. Um, I think that as women, we are often uh, under uh, appreciated or they see less of a threat when they're talking to me because they think, you know, she's weaker in some respects and therefore less threatening. Um, so I use that as my advantage. But I also think that we as women have more empathy than men and have more of a patience and tolerance to understanding others. And so I've, I've always used that to my advantage. But you know what's interesting to me is that I'm a mother as well and I travel doing this work. And whenever I travel, the one question that people ask me when they find out I'm a mother is, like, how do you do it? How are you a mother? And you do all this sort of very dangerous work and there's a judgment to that question always. My husband is a journalist who also does dangerous work and he never gets this question so there's always a double standard there uh, that I'm always trying to sort of fight against. So you title this season Traffic, the black market is closer than you think and it also explores the organ trade. Mm -hmm. I think there was one question where you ask even how many of these organs end up in American bodies. Can you tell me a little bit more about that story? Yeah, that was a crazy story because it's one of those things that you keep hearing but you think it's their rumors or you think they're part of Hollywood movies but these things aren't real. Are organs really being trafficked? But when you find out that 17 Americans die every single day waiting for, for an organ that never comes, you realize that there's a real demand out there and that there are actually people around the world that are willing to sell their organs because they can't find another, another way to survive. So this market, this crazy black market for organs actually exists and so we were able to sort of film the whole process and several people involved in the process of, you know, from the doctor's side to the people who are selling the organs um, and to the people who are also receiving these black market organs. So we, I, we, I think it was one of the most poignant interviews throughout this season was with this organ recipient who bought this organ in the black market for hundreds of thousands of dollars and he looked at me and he said you can judge me but what would you do if you were in my position and if you were dying or a loved one was dying what would you do mm. and I think it's a, a really good important question lastly what do you hope that viewers are able to take away from the season I think it's very important to understand that these black markets are all around us. Um, there, you know, you might think of a black market as these drugs or guns or scams or organ trafficking, crypto scams, cyber piracy, all of this happening in sort of far away, dark, deep corners of the world, but they're actually happening all around us. They're much more prevalent than we think. They have a deep and important impact, um, a negative impact in our lives. So trying to understand who are the operators, what motivates them. Again, the understanding before the judging is really truly the only way that we'll be able to tackle and, and combat these issues. Our thanks to Mona and Mariana for that conversation. And you can catch the start of the new season of Traffic tomorrow night on Nat Geo and streaming on Hulu. Still to come, breaking barriers and winning titles in the process. How two sisters are dominating on the wrestling mat. Grammy-winning artist Megan Thee Stallion. Megan was the victim of a crime. The woman was shot, wound up in the hospital. Rapper accused of shooting Megan Thee Stallion. Tori Lanez is accused of shooting her after a night out. Megan Thee Stallion and the trial of Tori Lanez. There were times that she wished that he had just killed her so she wouldn't have to have gone through what she went through in the last two years. This is Impact by Nightline. Stay strong, Megan. Meg, how do you feel? Now streaming only on Hulu. Zoo! 200! Oh, 200! 200 episodes of Dr. Pole. Oh. Music to my ears. It's been 10 years, and I'm still having fun. That rocks. He's got the moves that make your animals groove. Now we do the dance of joy. Yay. He's like the Justin Bieber of the <laughs> Headlining the hottest barns. Shut out. It's a show you won't want to miss. I'm not going to be here forever. Maybe. <laughs> the Incredible Dr. Pole. New episodes Saturdays at 9 on Nat Geo Wild. Thank <laughs> you.
From America's number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter. And it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. Reporting from Terrytown, New York, I'm Rob Marciano. Wherever the weather is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. All right, we are talking about two sisters. One is 11, the other nine. They are inspiring other girls to get on the mat and try their hat at wrestling. The pair is from Sea Isle, New Jersey. They're breaking barriers and winning major titles as they dominate the sport. In tonight's local lowdown, our partner station, WPVI, introduces us to these amazing athletes. There has to be, like, two people in the sport. You have to have someone to make you better. For me, that person is my sister. Good. Head position. Head positions. We practice together. We get better technique and become better wrestlers. Hey, go. Still, some people say it's not a sport for girls, but we show that you can do anything boys can do. Do it twice. Well, it's inspiring to other girls. Like, when my sister first started, there are only like three two, girls, three girls on the team, team and now there's including me. 23. So I think it's really helped grow girls wrestling. Up, oh, one, one. one. Oh. Kira was five, oh. and she said that she wanted to wrestle. One. Oh. So I talked to my wife. She said, you know, let her let her give it a try. Down. Seven. About midway through the following season. Down. Oh. Bryn saw all the accolades and everything that Kira was getting, so she said, I, I want to give this a try. And now we're traveling across the country. Push, snap, front headlock, circle score. Two-time state champs, both of them won states twice. And they've won a lot of boys' events as well. Push, Kira, push back. You know, watching them as a dad, it's, it's crazy. I wrestled growing up, but they've already are significantly more accomplished than I ever was. Good job. Good job, Kira. I want to go to the Olympics. I think it would be really amazing for someone who started out when she was just a little five-year-old girl to become an Olympic champion. Everybody bring it in. I've gotten this far, so why can't I just get farther? One, two, three, three more why not? Why not push until she gets further? Our, uh, much success to both of those young ladies there. And that's our show for tonight. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Good night. This is where I